cool. Let's start. Yes, let's start. It's 7.05 in Japan. I'm very happy to start out with tonight's workshop, Intro to Game Development, Building Your First Game with Godot Engine. Uh, and I'm very happy to welcome Khan, who is a Levagon alumni, who will be presenting today's workshop. And before we move on to the main, um, to the main content of the event, I would like to spare a couple of minutes of your time, as usual, to do a very short presentation of Leogon for those of you who haven't still heard of us, for those of you who already heard about us many times, feel free also to, you know, take a break for this one minute. For those of you who don't know about us, um, Khan, can you please stop sharing your screen for a while? Oh, sure. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Okay, cool. So my name is Sasha and I'm in charge of events and partnerships at Levagon Tokyo. And uh, what is Levagon Tokyo in short? It's a programming school. And what we do here, we teach people how to code, how to build web applications from scratch. And uh, from last year, how to deal with data. We do it in two formats, um, full-time for those who want to dive into tech right now. For those who have some family work commitments, we offer part-time option. Uh, two main courses that we do now is a web development bootcamp and data science bootcamp. A bit stats about us. We are one of the most uh, highly acclaimed bootcamps in the world, according to our student reviewers. And since founding in France in 2013, over 9,000 bootcamp graduates went through our bootcamp in 40 cities around the world. And since we're a very product-oriented bootcamp, we don't teach a lot of theory. So we focus mainly on teaching students how to build the web applications uh, from scratch. As you can see, we have over 2,000 web applications built uh, during and after the bootcamp. And as we focus a lot on the entrepreneurship, it's no wonder that we have a lot of uh, startup founders who um, launched their startups also after the bootcamp. A bit sad about our Tokyo campus. We so far had 19 batches and uh, close to 300 alumni already graded from our bootcamp. We have a very diverse, um, very diverse groups all the time. Every batch we have from seven to 14 nationalities participate and the average age is written here 29, but it's actually not true. We have people coming from 18 to 50 years old who want to change their life, uh, want to change their career, learn to code. We also run a dynamic tech community. Today event uh, is one of the good examples. So every week we have uh, hands-on workshops or events uh, or talks with tech speakers. Um, that's about the tech skills that we usually teach during the bootcamp. I'm not sure if those skills are enough to uh, become a game developer. So I'm pretty sure that Khan will provide more insights. Uh, what kind of skills do you need to learn more on top of that? Also the soft skills as you can see. And um, many of our graduates are hired by companies mentioned on this slide. What kind of career path you can choose after graduating from Levacon? Of course, a lot of people want to become developers. Um, some of people who want to combine both the business side and tech side become product managers. Some of them who want to um, dive in their own journey, become entrepreneurs, launch their own startup. Some of them want to become freelancers, don't want to uh, be uh, linked to any company. Some of them uh, write their own books about programming. This is our student from the first batch who already wrote the book, Programma Ninaritai. And this is probably everything from my side. Uh, thank you for staying with me. Now I am giving this microphone to Khan. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Sasha, for the introduction and the lovely slideshow. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. And is my voice transferring good? Amazing. Okay, great. Then let's begin. So welcome to my talk. This is Introduction to Game Development. Build your first game with the Godot game engine. So before we begin, I want to ask you guys, how many of you have experience in game development? Now, I'm not asking if you're an expert or not. I just want to know if you have 
any kind of experience. It can only be a YouTube video. If you write something in the chat, that would be awesome. Let's see if anyone has anything. Okay, RPG maker, that's great. No experience, that's fine too. Okay, if, okay, okay, we got a lot, cool. No experience, no, unity, great, zero, no, no. Basic experience, tabletop games, sure it counts, of course. Great, so we have a couple people saying yes and we have a lot of people saying no, and that's completely fine because in this talk, I'm gonna talk about what game development is, the history of game development and how games used to get built in the past and how is it now. We're gonna dive into game engines as well and what game engines are, why we need game engines. And then we're gonna dive into Godot, which is a game engine I've been using since the past year and I'm loving it and I'm really excited today to talk to you guys about it. So by the end of this talk, you're gonna gain a good understanding of game development in general and you're gonna learn about a popular game engine, which is Godot, so stick around. By the way, I'm Khan Alpar. I'm a game developer based in Turkey. I've been making games for a long time and I've been doing this full time as an independent developer since late 2019. I made a game called Beholder's Layer, which is available on Steam. I'm my own game studio. I cr create game tutorials on YouTube and Udemy. I'm gonna share links for all these things at the end. Great, so what are we going to cover in this talk? First, we're gonna start by talking about what game development is. Now, this might sound very simple because game development is making games it's simple, but I really wanna dig a little bit deeper and give you guys a more detailed picture of game development. Then we're gonna dive into the history of game development and we're gonna take a look at how people 30, 40 years ago built games. Then we're gonna switch to game engines and we're gonna talk about why game engines are awesome and why you should use them. And towards the end, we're gonna dive into Godot, which like I said, is an engine I've been using extensively and it's great. So feel free to ask questions during the workshop. Ideally, you would type something in the chat and I would read it and answer it for you. I'm going to take breaks at certain parts of the talk in order to let you guys type questions. So feel free. It's completely fine. So this is the start, the official start. So before this start, if you have any questions, go now. If not, I'm going to start. Looks like no one has any questions. Okay, we got one. What game genres do you have experience developing? So I've been making mainly 2D games. And my latest game, my actually, actually my first big commercial release, Beholders There, is a 2D platformer, which is very difficult. And it's actually called a precision platformer. Am I a, a solo studio? Yes, I'm a one person studio. I don't have any partners, at least I don't have any partners that I consistently work with, but occasionally I hire people in order to do certain tasks that I can't really do, like art, for example. Yeah, no problem. Okay, great. Then let's begin. So what is game development? So games, just like any other type of software are software. You need a programming language and you need to type some code in order to make it. But they have a few special properties that make them very complex compared to a more traditional type of software like 
a mobile app or maybe a website. These things are, for example, the graphics of a game. Most websites are static pages that don't really have any graphics, right? But if you have, for example, a 3D game, you need to create many, many 3D models. You need to animate them. You need to make them look fluid. So it's very difficult to create. And it's also very difficult for computers to run games. It takes a lot of processing power. And, and that's just graphics. You also have things like artificial intelligence inside of games. You have things like physics, physics systems, some physics-based games actually need to create whole systems in order to simulate real life physics. So it's very complex, I would say, compared to 95% of other software, unless you're making the drivers for the next, next SpaceX spaceship, games are pretty complex. So I like to use the analogy of construction between software engineer or game development and construction, because construction is really like based in real world and it, it's easy to wrap your head around. So if you think of software engineering as construction, let's say building a simple website is like building a house, then building a game would be building a skyscraper. It's a lot of work. Now, granted games differ in complexity as well. So for example, a simple 2D game like Mario might take an experienced developer less than six months to create, whereas a big game like GTA V, for example, takes five years for a thousand people to create. And sometimes those games aren't even done at the end when they release it, so they have to keep updating it. So it's very, very complex. And as you might have imagined, you don't want to build a skyscraper with just your bare hands or just a hammer, for example. It's going to take you way too long. And that's where game engines come in actually, but I'm gonna talk more about that later. Now let's talk about how game development used to work. So back in the day, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when software in general was a relatively new thing, developers didn't really have any pre-made tools to work with. So they had to create everything from scratch. For example, right now, as I'm going to get to in just a second, we have game engines, which are tools, a tool, like a set of tools that are wrapped inside of a software that helps you build a game. But back in the day, they would have to do everything from scratch. They would have to use very low level programming languages like C and C++ and sometimes even assembly language, which is just one level above machine code. They had to use those languages in order to create games. So that's why back in the day, the only game developers were actually very skilled engineers. The normal person didn't really have access to game development tools because there weren't any and you had to make them on your own. These are things like, for example, the physics engine of a game. If you're making a game that needs to simulate real life physics, you first need to sit down and write all that physics functionality. You need to create your own rendering engine, which does the graphics for the game. You need to create an input system for getting input from a keyboard or a mouse. All these things right now are available to you out of the box with game engines. But back in the day, developers had to create these on their own. This took a very, very long time. So oftentimes they had to build these basic structures before they started building the game. So for example, uh, building on the example of Mario, if it takes six months to make a game like Mario, if you're gonna make it from scratch, which means you're gonna develop all the engine code yourself that you get for free from an engine, it's gonna take you at least six more months and it can even take up to a year or more if you're really, really getting into it. And like, I don't even wanna talk about bigger games than Mario, it takes a long time. But now it's different because now we have 
game engines. So what is a game engine? Like I said, a game engine is a set of tools that help you in developing your game. So building on the analogy of construction, imagine having to build a house using your hands or a hammer. It's very difficult and it's gonna take you ages. And I would dare say it's practically impossible because some tasks are just impossible to achieve using just your hands. So in that case, like I said, you need to first stop and create the tools that you're gonna to use to build the house. And it's the same in game development. So the good thing is game engines give you those tools so that you don't have to think about building a physics engine or a rendering engine. You can just work on your game. That's what basically game engines are. So the game engines give developers the tools to create games. They recently, and by recently, I mean the last 10 years, became popular. Sorry, there's a truck passing. OK, it's gone now. So they recently became popular and made game development much more accessible. Like I said, back in the day, game developers were highly skilled engineers. But nowadays, anyone can become a game developer. With some of these engines, you don't even have to write any code. You can just use what's called a visual scripting language in which you just need to connect bits and pieces of logic in order to create games. So it's much more accessible. Anyone can just download one of these engines. They're completely free usually. So it's, it's great. Most pop popular of these engines include Unity, Unreal, and Godot. These are the most notable ones and these are the ones that you wanna go with really. And let me go back there for a second. And these engines are usually free, but sometimes they, for example, I think Unreal takes a percentage of your income if you make a game with the Unreal engine and you release it. And I think Unity had a similar royalty agreements that I don't really remember right now, but it's nothing major. It's completely worth it and you should go for it. Okay, so now let's get to Godot. Godot came out in 2014. It's relatively new compared to Unity and Unreal, and it became really popular a couple of years ago. I stumbled upon it, I think around four years ago, but I didn't really pay attention, pay attention to it that much. But since last year, I've been using it professionally and it's a blast. So some of the perks of Godot is that it's very, very lightweight. So usually with game engines like Unity and Unreal, you need to download gigabytes of data. The engines are very big, so you need to boot them up. It takes time when, you, when you're trying to build your game, it takes even more time. So if you have a slow computer, those engines are a bit difficult to work with, but Godot is very lightweight. I think it's around 60 megabytes in total. You don't even have to go through an installation wizard. You can just download it from the website, which I'm gonna show you later, and then you just need to unzip it. It's great. It's beginner friendly. So I would say that out of these three engines, Godot is the most beginner friendly, Unity is second and Unreal is the last one. Godot is just overall is very suited towards beginners. It has, it uses scenes and nodes, which I'm gonna explain later on to create games, which make it really intuitive to create levels and logic in, in your game. It has its own scripting language, GDScript, which is very similar to Python. So if you have experience in Python or maybe Ruby, you will feel right at home with GDScript. It's a dynamic language, doesn't have any curly braces, it doesn't have any semicolons, it's, it's very easy and fast to work with. And it's completely made for Godot, by the way, it's not an external language. It's a language that's developed by the developers of Godot just for Godot, so that's extra awesome in my opinion. It's free and completely open source. So this is a great perk actually. So for example, if you're using Unity and there's a bug in the engine, which usually is the case, at least at some point of development, you're basically stuck. 
you need to wait until the Unity team comes up with a patch and then you need to download that patch and then you're fixed. But sometimes this takes time and sometimes during development, you need to move fast and you need to get things done. So because Godot is open source, you can basically change the code as you wish. You can download the project from GitHub, you can set it up on your system and you can make any change that you want. You can fix a bug, you can even improve Godot and add contributions of your own. And if you really make a good contribution, you can commit it on GitHub. And then if they accept it, you will officially be one of the developers of Godot. How cool is that? And since it's free, you don't have to pay anything to anyone. It's completely free. So like I said, scenes and nodes make it very easy to build levels. I'm gonna get to this when we get to the live coding part. And also has a cool logo. Okay, so, so far was the slideshow part. And now if you have any questions, send them to me and I'm gonna answer them. So yeah, lots of people use Unity because Unity is by far the most popular option. So it's just like, it's, it's the one that's the oldest, I think, and it's the one that's most, most people use. So most people recommend using Unity. So it's like a feedback loop and it's, it's the most complete of all these engines. So it's the oldest, people have made tons of games with it and it has excellent documentation. It has an excellent community. So it has a lot of things going for it. So that's why I think most people use it. And I would say any of these engines are just a tool in order for you to make your game. So it's gonna depend on your game. So if you wanna make an FPS game, for example, you should probably use Unreal Engine. That's gonna suit you better. But if you wanna make a 2D game, let's say a 2D pixel art game, I would say go with Godot and maybe Unity, but Godot is really, good with those types of games. And Unity is more of a general game engine that you can take and turn it into anything, really. Is a Godot engine limited in what it can do compared to Unity and Unreal? Like I said, Godot, Unreal, Unity, and other game engines, these are just tools. They have their advantages, they have their disadvantages, and it's just gonna come down to what you want to do. Is Godot limited compared to Unity and Unreal? For example, on the 2D side, I would say no, it's just as capable, but on the 3D side, it's, it's not as good as Unity or Unreal. So if you're gonna make a 3D game, I would say go with Unity or Unreal and maybe come back to Godot a couple of years later when they got better uh, 3D support. Great question, by the way. Okay, if this is all the questions, which it looks like it, let's begin the coding. Okay, oops, not yet. Okay, so we're gonna start by downloading and installing Godot. So I have the Godot's website opened up right here. It's godotengine.org. And from here, you need to go to the download section. By the way, you don't have to follow along because this live code session is mostly gonna be a demonstration for you to see how a very, very simple 2D game is built using Godot. Because chances are you don't really have much experience in game development and it's really difficult to understand these things just, just, just on the first time, right? If I try to explain everything, this talk would take three hours or maybe even more. So I'm gonna go a bit fast and I'm not gonna really explain everything down to the last detail. So this is just for you to get 
a basic idea of how a simple 2D game is built. So don't worry if you don't understand something or if you like lost yourself while trying to keep up, it's fine. I'm not expecting you to understand everything. Just, just get some inspiration and get a basic idea. Okay, with that said, let's install Godot. So here inside the download section, you need to pick your operating system. Then you're gonna pick a version. There's 32 bits and 64 bit. Go with 64 unless you have a 32 bit system. And the mono version has C sharp support. If you wanna use C sharp in Godot, go with this one. But in this case, we're gonna install the standard version. So click on this and once you do, you will get the zip file inside of your downloads. Let me bring that up real quick. I downloaded it already so that we don't have to wait. You're gonna get this zip file. So you want to unzip this. And once you do, inside of this folder, you have an exe file, and this is all you need to run Godot. Like I said, no installation, nothing. It's very lightweight. It's very easy to install. So I, what I usually do is I have a folder inside of my system, inside of my documents, I have a folder called apps. And in here I have Godot. Inside of this folder, I keep all the different versions of Godot. In this case, we're gonna use 3.2.3, .3, but I have, as you can see, these earlier versions as well. So, right, let's open up Godot. I have the shortcut here inside of my taskbar. And once you click on the exe file, the project manager comes up and the project manager is basically just the list of the projects that you created in the past. It's for you to create new projects, delete the old ones, maybe import an existing one. It's really just a proxy between Godot and you. In this case, we want to create a new project. I'm gonna name this intro to game dev workshop. Let's choose a location to, for this inside of the file system. I already created a folder for it here. Let's create a new one to store this project. Let's say intro to game dev workshop. Okay, now let's hit create and edit and that's gonna create a new blank project. And this is what Godot is. This is what's called the editor. So this is where all the action takes place and this is where you're gonna spend most of your time in. So before we start building the game, I'm gonna quickly give you guys an introduction and overview of the different parts of Godot. So the main thing that you see, the part that's taking the most screen real estate is the viewport, which I'm showing you right now. I hope you can see my mouse because I'm gonna use it a lot. So the, the viewport is basically what's inside of your game. By the way, if you can't can see my mouse, just leave a comment now and I'll, I'll fix it. The viewport is what's inside of your game. Okay, great. And basically everything that's inside of your game will be visible here. So you can build a level or change things. Then we have the scene tab here on the left. And the scene tab shows you the contents of the active scene. And you can think of a scene as a level of your game. A scene is a level. Under the scene tab, we have the file system. And the file system is very simple. It just shows you the files that you have inside of your project. In this case, we only have the default Godot icon, which is included in every project and some other default files. On the right side, we have the inspector. The inspector shows you the properties of a selected object. For example, if I double click on this icon here, I can see a preview of it inside the inspector and I can see some other useful information related to this file. That's what the inspector does. Above the inspector, we have the playtest buttons. These buttons let you play the game or stop the game depending on what you wanna do. And finally, here we have all the scenes that are open, which I'm gonna to get to 
in just a second. And below here, we have the output tab. And this is this works like a debug window. And it just shows you all the different messages that Godot is trying to show you. Or if you want to print uh, a string because you're trying to debug, this is where you, you will see your text printed. OK, great. Those are the basic, like the crucial things that you need to know. But there are so many different menus and windows here. But I'm just going to start building the game, and we're going to build as we go along. Before I begin, if you have any questions about the interface, uh, just let me know, and I can explain it better. Because at first, it might look a bit intimidating, but it's really not. Once you get the hang of it, it's, it's very simple, actually. So OK, I'll keep an eye out for questions and keep going. So in this case, we're going to build a 2D game. So right now, as you can see, by default, Godot shows us the 3D view. So if you want to make a 3D game, this is where you want to be. But we're going to make a 2D game. So I'm going to switch to 2D from this toolbar right here. Oops. Go away. OK, zoom is kind of obstructing the way. OK, great. <laughs> so this is the 2D view. As you can see, it's completely empty. And let's start by creating a new scene. So like I said, a scene is a level of your game. In this case, we're only going to have a single level. To create a scene, we need to add a node. And you add a node using this plus icon here. And a node is the, the basic building blocks of Godot. You can think of it as a game object. A node can be a 2D image. It can be a collision shape. It can be a button on a menu that you have. So it's basically like Legos. You can think of nodes as a box full of Legos. And you have all these different models of Legos that you can use to build things. That's what nodes are, essentially. And we have three main different types of nodes. 3D nodes, 2D nodes, and user interface nodes, which are used to create things like menus or in-game overlays. 3D nodes are under this special, special node, which is highlighted in, which has this uh, red circle icon next to it. User interface nodes are inheriting from the control node, and the 2D nodes are under the node 2D node here. By the way, this is all the nodes that are inside of Godot. I can see a list of all of them here. So we're going to take a look at 2D nodes. And as you can see under node 2D, I have all these nodes available to me. Like I said, they're very similar to different types of Legos. For example, I have a camera node, which I can use to create a 2D camera. I have a light 2D node, which creates a 2D light inside of my game. I have a node to play audio. I have a node to display a 2D image, which is the sprite node. In this case, we're going to use a node 2D, which is a 2D game object that only has a position, a rotation, and a scale. Let's click on this, and let's hit Create. So as you can see, I now have a node inside of my game, and I'm going to rename this to Game. And this is going to be the container for everything that I'm going to create. Let's save this. And this is going to be called game.tscn, which is the extension scenes have in Godot. Let's save it inside the file system. OK, right. I now have a scene in my game. That means I can run my game. So let's do that real quick. I'm going to click on this play icon here. And before we can run the game, we first need to define a main scene. And the main scene is the scene that gets run when the game starts. So let's select the only scene that we have. And once we do that, Godot will open up and we have a blank game currently. By the way, I'm not sure if you can see, but inside of my viewport here, I have a blue rectangle, which is showing me how big my game window is. And everything that I place here will be visible when I run my game. So the first thing I want to create is the background. 
And to create a background, I'm going to use a node, which is called a tile map. So let's go back to add a new node again. And let's do a search for tile map. And as you can see, a tile map is under node 2D. It's, it's actually inheriting from node 2D. If you know a little bit about inheritance and object-oriented programming, that's the way it works in Godot. So in this case, every, every node is inheriting from this base node type. For example, tile map is inheriting from node 2D. Node 2D is inheriting from canvas item. Canvas item is inheriting from the base node type. Let's create a new tile map. Tile map is very simple. It lets you take an image and it lets you tile it so that you can create a bigger image. To use it, we need to create a tile set. So if you look at the inspector, we can see all the properties that this tile map has. It has a mode, it has a tile set, it has some compat compatibility modes and all sorts of properties that you can change and you can play with. And like I said, this is what the inspector lets you do. We can take a look at the game node here and you can see that it, it doesn't have as many properties as the tile map because it's a simpler node. It only has a transform, which has a position, a rotation and a scale. But if we click on the tile map, it has some specific functionality that lets you use tile maps. It also has the node 2D, the canvas item and the node as well because it's inheriting from them. Okay, let's create a new tile set which I'm going to do by hitting this empty here and click on new tile set. To use the tile set, we need to give this tile set an image. And to do that, let's go ahead and import some assets into our game. I'm going to create a new folder inside my file system. This is going to be called assets. And now I'm going to import three 2D images into my game, which I have inside my file system. Let's drag these into Godot. And they will be imported automatically. So right now I have three images inside of my project. One for the player, one for the grass, which is going to be the background and one for coin. So let's take this grass texture and let's feed this into the tile set. And that's gonna allow us to create the tile set. I'm gonna create a new single tile because we only have a single image. And we need to specify the region, which I'm gonna do. But first we need to set the size of this image, which is 64 pixels by 64 pixels. Okay, now we're ready to use this. So let's go back and click on our tile map. And now I can basically use this image to paint a background. Okay, we have a question, does the images have to be PNGs. No, they don't really have to, but it's by far the most popular image extension I use at least. So as you can see, basically we can use this image to tile and paint a background image. And I can even do something like this. And just like I said, we only need to worry about this blue rectangle here because that's the extent of our screen. In a bigger game, you would have different levels and you would have a camera and this wouldn't be the case, but for this game, it's really tiny and simple. So this is just fine. So let's run the game and see what it looks like. As you can see, now we have a background. Our game is look, starting to look better, but now we need to create the player. Okay, the player is going to be another scene. So like I said, in Godot, we use scenes to create the game. Anything can be a scene. For example, in this case, we have a game scene that is the main scene of the game. And now we're gonna create a player scene that's going to be inside that game scene. And for example, inside of the player scene, we can have another scene called, let's say, weapon, and so on and so forth. So 
scenes are really how you think in Godot when you're creating a game. Let's create a new scene. And this scene is going to be, well, first we need to create a node. And this node is going to be of type area 2D. And this node is very simple as well. It's just a 2D area that you can use to detect collisions. Let's create this. And the first node that you add to a scene becomes the root node. And all the other nodes are actually children of that node. Let's rename this to player. And let's save this scene inside of the file system. Now to create the player, we still need to have some graphics in order to see the player inside of the game. But a tile map isn't going to work with the player because we don't need to tile any image. We just need to use a single 2D image. And to do that, we're going to use the sprite node. So let's create a new node. Let's do a search for sprite. And this sprite node, if you take a look at the inspector, has a texture property. Whatever texture you give to this property will be displayed inside of the game. So let's use that player.png asset that we have. I'm going to left click, hold, and drag this into the game and to the texture property of the sprite. And now, as you can see, we have the player visible inside of the game. Great. Let's go back to the game scene because remember, the player is its own scene now. So we need to go back by clicking on the game scene here. And we need to create the player. We need to add the player to this scene as well. And we do that by using this instance button. First, make sure you have the game node selected. Otherwise, if you have the tile map, for example, the player is going to be a child of the tile map. Let me show you what that looks like. If I click on instance, which gives me a list of all the scenes, and I click on the player scene and I say open, that creates a new player inside of the game scene. But as you can see, it's indented under the tile map. And that means it's a child of the tile map. It, Godot, as you can see, is following closely the object-oriented programming paradigm. Everything is either a parent or a ch child. In this case, the game is the root node, tile map is the ch child of the game node, and in this case, we made the player a, ch a child of the tile map. So let's take the player and let's drop him on the game scene so that it's not a child of the tile map anymore. Great, now we have a player in the game. We can run the game and see what it looks like. It's a bit too large, so let's go back into the player scene and let's click on the sprite and let's go inside its transform property here and set its scale to be 0.5 instead of one. Now, if I run the game, it looks much more appropriate. Great. Now, the only thing left to do, the only node left to add here is a collision shape. So let's add a new node. We have a question. Can we manually scale it? Yes, you should be able to manually scale it as well if you use these orange icons here. As you can see, I can basically scale it to whatever size I want. And if you hold down shift, it's not going to lose its proportions, actually. Great. So the only thing left to do here is to create a collision shape so that the player can collide with other objects in the game. Let's create a new node. Let's do a search for collision shape. And there are two collision shapes. This first one is for 3D games. We don't want that. We want this collision shape 2D. And this basically represents the shape of the player. So the sprite is the graphics part. And the collision shape has to do with physics. This collision shape has a shape property inside of this inspector. So we need to create a new shape. I'm going to use a capsule shape and roughly give it the same size as the player. We don't need to be perfect here. This size will just be fine. 
And this collision shape is going to make more sense in just a moment when we create the coins. So bear with me. OK, now we can run the game. We have the player. We have the background. It's looking great. But the problem is we, have, we don't have any way to control the player. So we want to have the ability to use the arrow keys or maybe WSD to make the player move. So let's do that now. To do that, we need to create a script. So let's click on the player node and let's hit this button, which will create a new script for us. And the language is going to be GD script. And this will create a script called player.gd. And as you can see, the script is associated with this scene because now there's a script icon here and everything that I write here, I can affect the player scene. Great, the first thing I'm gonna do is to define a speed variable. I'm gonna set this to 150. So this is GD script, this is Godot's custom language. And it's like I said, it's very similar to Python. The way you create new variables is by using the keyword var and you don't need to specify the type, it's fine. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a built-in method called physics process. And this is how you define a method in Godot or a function. You need to use the func keyword followed by the function name, parentheses, parameters, and at the end, you need to use a column. And if you don't have any body for the function, you need to use this pass keyword. And by the way, GD script is indentation sensitive. So for example, for this function, GD script is expecting you to indent everything that you want to be included by one tab. So if I have this, for example, it's gonna give me an error. Great, so this physics process is a method that's built into Godot that's called 60 times per second. I can show you this by printing, writing a print statement here like this. So this function will be called 60 times per second. So in theory, we should get this print statement printed inside the output tab here, 60 times per second. So let's run the game and let's see what this looks like. As you can see, Godot is trying to print an insane amount of statements every second because we're running the print statement inside of the physics process. Great. So we can leverage the fact that this function is being called so many times a second and we can make the player move inside of this function. To do that, we need to create some input actions first. So let's go inside the project settings from the project menu here. And in here, we need to go to the input map section. And in here, we can create new input actions. And what an input action is, is very simple. It's just a way for you to get input from maybe a keyboard or maybe your mouse. It can be anything. First, you need to create some actions for it. You're gonna have four different actions, one to move up, one to move down, left and right. So let's create move up, move down, move right, and finally move left. At the bottom here, I have these, these newly created input actions. Now I need to give them the keys that I want them to be associated with. To move up, I'm going to use the W key. To move down, I'm going to use the S key. To move right, I'm going to use the D key. And to move left, I'm going to use A. So as you can see, I associated each input action with a key on my keyboard. And if I wanted to, I could add more keys to these. For example, for moving right, I could also add the right arrow, for example, and now I have two keys associated with the move right input action. And now I can use both of them to make the player go right. Great, so now let's go back to the script and let's actually use these input actions. 
to do that, like I said, we're going to do this inside the physics process, and we need to create some a few input few if statements, and we need to use the input class. Let's start basic and let's make the player move right. So if input dot is action pressed, we need to give this the input action, which is going to move be move right. If the right move input action is pressed, let's take the position of the player. Let's access its X property because we want it to move horizontally and let's increase it by speed. And we also need to multiply this by Delta. Don't worry about Delta too much. It just has to do with frame rates and making sure the game runs at the same frame rate across different devices. It's something you'll learn if you really want to get into game development. But basically here, what we're saying is if the move right action is pressed, which is when we press the D or the right arrow down, let's start increasing the player's position on the X axis by speed. So if I run this and if I press D or if I press the right arrow, you can see that the player is moving right. So this is the basic, the most basic way you can create a top-down character controller in a game using Godot. And this is exactly how we're gonna make it move left, up, and down. So I'm just gonna copy these lines in order to save some time and paste them for three more times. And let's change these to be move left, move up, and finally move down. For moving left, we're gonna subtract from position.x and for moving up and down, we're gonna use position.y because we want to move vertically and we're gonna subtract for moving up and increase for moving down. So with these, I should be able to move in all directions. And as you can see, I can use the arrow keys sorry, the WSD keys to move up, down, left, or right. And this is basically our player controller. So before we continue further, if you have any questions about how I made this, feel free to ask. And we have a question already. So where is the speed and delta are defined? Okay, great question. So the speed variable is defined here because we defined it at the top. So that's a variable that we created. But the delta variable is actually a variable that's given to us because this function here, physics process, is a built-in method that Godot, it's actually a callback method, if you know what that means. So it's being run 60 times per second, and we can actually tap into it, and it gives us, oh, here we go, this is the delta if you want to use it. Does anyone else have any questions? The method name for this method, like I said, it's a built in method. So you can't change this method. So if I did something like this, for example, this wouldn't work. So you're not going to get an error because it's a valid method definition, but if you try to run your game, you're not going to be able to move anymore because Godot doesn't know what this method is, basically. Exactly, it's like an override, basically. Okay, so there's a question from Rob. I guess we're not doing it anything so complex today, but how do things like jumping or attack work? So yes, we're not doing anything complex because like I said, I want to keep this as a beginner friendly talk. So if I get into things like jumping, attacking, like it's going to be much more complicated, but actually this isn't in the talk, but I can show you guys what like, the game that I made looks like inside of Godot. So if I open up beholders layer here,
as you can see, I have tons of files inside of my file system. I have fonts, music, resources, scenes, singletons, tons of stuff. And I can actually show you what this level looks like here. Let's take a look at level one. And this is basically what it looks like. And I can also show you guys the player character, which is this guy right here. As you can see, he has tons of stuff inside of its scene. It's a node that we don't, didn't see so far. It's called kinematic body. It means it's a physics node that you need to define the movement yourself. And for this character, actually I programmed jumping, wall jumping, basically everything you need for a platformer character. So let me show you guys what this looks like. I'm, I'm gonna mute the game so that you don't get any sound. Skip. And I actually have some mobile controls on, so let me turn that off real quick. <laughs> because this game is actually on Android. I think I released it on Android last week. So you can check it out there as well. Let's turn off the story scene. Okay. So this is the main menu of the game. So as you can see, I have a character that can jump around. And if I play the game, I can jump, I can collect things. And this is basically a full game made in Godot. And I can show you what the script for the player looks like if you wanna see what, I mean, the question was how does jumping work, right? And or attacking and that kind of stuff. And I guess I'm going off a tangent here, but this is how the script looks like. So as you can see, there's tons of code here. Uh, let me show you, I think jumping happens here actually. So I have, the player has a velocity and I'm basically setting the Y property of the velocity to the jump force that I'm giving to this method. And I'm, I actually, I'm, I'm actually applying some bonuses as well, depending on the items you have. And I have the sound effect playing here, for example. And I also have the state machine here that also does some extra stuff. But yeah, if this is something that you are interested in, I'm glad I showed it to you, but let's now get back to the talk. Uh, so yeah, this is the player, uh, more or less. So now inside of the game, okay, we have another question real quick. Does Godot have a visual programming option for this as well or only coding? Yes, Godot has a visual language. It's called visual script, I think. And for example, if I try to create a script here, there is an option to pick a language. And here you can see there is visual script. So you can pick this and you can create a script. And I'm not gonna get into that now because honestly, I don't really have experience doing visual scripting, but maybe if you can contact me after this talk, maybe I can give you more information about that. Yeah, no problem. Okay, great. So we have the player, we can walk around, we can explore this, awesome, amazing world that we created, but it's kind of boring. We need to create a goal for the player and that's going to be the coins. So let's create a new scene. I can create a new scene by clicking this plus icon here. That's gonna create an empty scene. Let's create a root node. This is, going, this is also going to be an area 2D. Let's rename this to be coin. Let's save this inside the file system. And just like the player, let's give this a sprite in order to display some graphics. I'm gonna use this coin.png file here. Let's give this to the texture property of the sprite. I have the sprite selected as you can see. Great. So now I see that there's a question but I'm gonna answer it after I create this coin. Now I'm gonna go back to the game scene and here let's instance a coin. Whoa, it's huge, it's giant, it's too big. Let's go back and let's shrink this down a little bit. So I'm gonna set its scale property to be 0.3 on the X and on the Y. This is gonna make it a normal size. 
Let's go back to the coin scene again. And finally, we also need to create a collision shape for this. This one is going to be a circle shape. Let's set it to be the right size. Let's go back to the game scene. As you can see, I have the coin here and I have my player. They both have collision shapes. So let's run the game first and let's see what's going to happen. So if I touch the coin, nothing happens. Ideally, we want the coin to be disappearing and we want the player's score to be more. But right now we didn't really implement the score yet, so let's not worry about that. But first, let's make it so that when the player touches the coin, the coin disappears or gets deleted. So this is why we have these collision shapes. So as you can see, the player has the capsule shape and the coin has the circle shape. So we're going to use these shapes in order to detect collisions in between these objects. If we go back to the player scene and we take a look at this node tab here next to the inspector, inside of here we have a bunch of signals. So uh, signals are a major part of Godot and it's one of those things that make building games with Godot awesome. And they are very, very simple. You can think of a si signal as a signal that's being emitted when a certain action happens. For example, this is an area 2D, so it has a signal for area entered. And this signal will be emitted when another area enters this area. So let's go back to the game scene and maybe I can give you guys a more visual example. So like I said, the area 2D has a signal for when another area enters it. So for example, when the player is walking here and it touches this circle, it means that another area, which is, which is the coin, has entered its collision shape. And that's why, and that's when that area entered signal is emitted. The area 2D is basically saying, hey, something just entered me. That's basically what it is. And we can use this in order to detect when the player is touching the coin. To use the signal, let's go inside the player scene. And from the list of the signals, let's pick the one we want, which is area entered. And we can click on connect here in order to connect the signal to the player's script. And this is going to take us to the player script. And inside of here, Godot generated a method for us called on player area entered. So this is basically telling us that whenever the signal is emitted, this method will be run. So let's demonstrate this real quick by printing a simple statement inside of this method like player area entered. Now, if I run the game and if I touch a coin, you can see that inside of my output tab here, that's string is being printed. So every time I touch the coin, the same line of code is being executed. So you can see how we can use this in order to delete the coin. Because this method actually passes us the game object that we collided with. In this case, it's the coin. So this area variable here, here, let me zoom a little bit so it's easier to see. This area method here, variable here, is the coin. So we can basically say area.q3, which is the method that you use in order to delete a game object. So now, if we run the game, when we touch the coin, it should disappear. Because when we touch it, that signal area entered is being emitted. And when that signal is emitted inside of the player script, this method is being run. Because of that, we're deleting the coin. It's very simple, actually. OK, great. Now the basic game functionality is done. So now let's actually duplicate this coin 
to create a couple more points. I'm going to create around 10 different coins. I'm actually going to use Control D, which is short, the shortcut for duplicating objects. Wait, let's create one more, maybe. OK, now we have a more complete game. I can now walk around. I can collect coins. And I can be happy that I have coins, right? But we should be able to see at least a score so that the game is more interactive. So let's do that now. But before that, if you have any questions, send them now so that I will try to answer them. We actually had a question just now from Sergi. Can you include NPCs? What level of interaction can they have with the player? Can you embed even rudimentary AI? Yes to all of those questions. You can create NPCs, you can create AI. Like I said, a game engine is basically like a box of Legos or Play-Doh. You can take it and turn it into whatever you want. You have a programming language in your hands and you have all these tools that Kudo provide you. So sky is basically the limit. NPC is, Jan asked the question, what is NPC? NPC is a non-player character. So it might be, for example, if in our game, let's add a sprite here inside of the game scene. Let's give this the player image. And let's actually, yeah, let's set, keep this this size and let's change its color to be like red. <laughs> and let's rename this to red boy. So now I basically have an NPC in my game. It doesn't do anything, it's just standing there, but it's basically a non-player character. And I could create, for example, a dialogue system in which I could interact with this NPC here. And I could even like, like going from your question, I can also uh, create AI for this NPC and I could make him walk around in circles or something. We have a question from Eric. How hard is it to spawn those coins randomly? Uh, from code, you mean? It's, it's very basic, actually. Yeah, no problem, Sergio. Yeah, so depends on how you want to spawn them, right? Do, do you want to spawn them like in, in a line or like completely randomly? That would be, I can actually show it to you if we add a script to the game scene here. GD script. Well, this is going above what I planned, but I guess let's just do a real quick demonstration. So I need to get a reference to the coin scene and inside of the ready method here, which is the method that's run when the game begins. So everything that I include under this method will be run immediately when the game starts. For example, I can define uh, an integer here called number of coins, set it to 10, for example. And inside of ready, I can say for i in range number of coins. Let's create a new coin. And we can set the position of the coin to be random. We can use the two. We can use the random i method to get a random integer. Divide that by, I think 1024 is the screen width. Let's do the same for the screen height. I think it's 600 around, maybe a bit more. And we need to add this as a child as well. I'm really going off here. Don't worry if you're not following along at all, it's fine. So let's see if this works. Oop, it doesn't because area 2D, do our coin. Oh yeah, okay, I was doing the wrong thing actually. We need to preload this instead of getting a reference. Okay, now it should work. And let me go ahead and delete these coins that I have inside of the scene so that it's obvious. So his question was, can you spawn coins from code randomly? And 
Now I don't have any coins inside of the scene. And if I run the game, I have some randomly placed coins. They're a bit badly placed, but you can play with the uh, instancing to uh, make it more um, organic, I guess. I hope that answers your question. So let's take a look at more questions. You, so Rob asked, don't you need to close those functions? And the answer is no, because in Godot, in GD script, I should say, like Python, it's all about indenting your code. You don't need to use any curly braces. You don't need to use any semicolons at the end of lines. You, only thing you need to make sure is that indenting is right. For example, here inside of this ready method, I have a for, for loop and that has to be indented one line and everything I have inside of that for loop, I have to indent one level as well. So if I had these one level back like this, it's not going to work because GD scripts can't really understand that. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, looks like we don't have any more questions. So let's keep on going. So the final thing is going to be creating the user interface, let's say. We want the player to see his score. And to do that, we need to create a new node. And this is going to be a label. The label is actually a user interface node. It displays a plain text and that's all it does actually. So let's create a new label. Let's rename this to score label. And it's right here. It's very small by default. Let's give it some text. It has a text property inside of the inspector. Let's give it some default text like score equals 999. And right now, if we run the game, it's very tiny. So let's scale it up. So let's scale it up to be around three. If I run the game now, looks a bit better. And now we have the score label inside of the game. Only thing we need to do now is to make this update properly. So two things. At the start of the game, we want the score to be set to zero. And once we collect a coin, we want the score to increase, let's say by 10. So first let's set the score to zero when the game starts. So going back to the game script, we have this ready method here. And this ready method, like I said, will be run as soon as the game starts. So inside of here, we can set the score label to zero. So first of all, let's actually create a variable to keep track of the score, which is going to be zero by default. Inside of ready, let's change this, change the text of the score label to be zero as well. So in order to access the score label, I'm gonna use what is called a dollar sign notation. So I can put a dollar sign and everything I type after it, if it's a valid node name, I can access it from this script. For example, this script is attached to the game node. So inside of this script, I can use the dollar sign to control any of the children nodes. These include the tile map, the player, the red boy, and the score label. In this case, I'm accessing the score label. So once I have the score label, I can get its text property and I can change it to something like score equals the string version of our score here. So this is gonna make it so that when the game runs, my score is zero instead of that 999 default value we had. Okay, so the final thing left to do is changing the score when we collect coins. And to do that, we're also going to use a signal, but this time we're going to create our own signal. So let's go to the player scene. And from the player scene, let's go to the player script. And we know that inside of the player script, we can detect when the player touches a coin. So we're going to use that and we're going to create a custom signal by using the signal keyword. 
And this signal is going to be called player coin collected. And to use the signal inside of code, all we have to do is use the emit signal method and give it the name of the signal that we're trying to call. So once we touch a coin, first we're going to delete that coin, then we're going to emit the signal player coin collected. So we have the signal ready. Now we have to listen to the signal from the game scene. So let's go back to there. So I'm inside the game scene. There's a player here. If I click on it, and if I go to its signals tab here, I can see that the, the custom signal that we just created appeared here. It's called player coin collected. So now let's connect this to the game script by using the connect button. And this will generate a function for us called on player, player coin collected. And inside of here, we can basically do a print statement to demonstrate that this works. I'm just gonna type player collected the coin. You should increase the score. So let's run this and see what it looks like. So whenever I collect a coin, you can see that this method is being called and we're, we're printing the statement appropriately as well. So after this, it's just a matter of in increasing the score inside of this method. I'm just gonna increase it by a hard coded value like 10 or maybe 15. And then we also need to update the score label. But first let's print the new score instead of updating the label, just so that we, we see it works before we change other things. So now if I collect a coin, you can see that my score is being printed. And each time I collect more, my score is increasing. So now the final step is to do the exact thing we did here. I can just copy and paste this and update the score label based on the new score variable. And if I do that, you can see that my score is being updated properly and I can collect coins. And we have a very simple 2D game in our hands that we can take from here and maybe create more levels. Maybe we can create more mechanics. Maybe we can add enemies, but this will be the base for that. So that's it. Thank you for listening. So like I said, you can find me on Instagram at Kanalpar. If you want to learn more about game development, you should subscribe to my YouTube channel. I make tutorials about Godot and game development in general. If you're really serious about learning game dev, check out my course on Udemy. I provided links for all of these things and I'm gonna share these slides just, just after this inside the chat, so don't worry. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, no problem, Eric. <laughs> no problem, guys. It was my pleasure. It was very fun. Thank you so much, Khan. Um, would you mind sharing your um, accounts? Okay, if you guys want my email, let me share that real quick yep. here. So what, there's a question from Bluewind, why the collision shapes are necessary, necessary for the signal. Okay, let me go back to Godot, oops. So you need the collision shape in order for the area 2D to work. So the player is an area 2D and all physics nodes in Godot need to have a collision shape. It's what defines the shape of the player. So for example, if you didn't have a shape, there would be no way for you to interact with the coins in this case. So it's absolutely crucial.
Rob said, are some general questions okay? Yes, it's completely fine. In the meantime, let me just make share these slides with you guys. Oh, thanks Sasha for sharing my YouTube channel. So Rob said, what was the breakdown of your time spent with planning, development, testing, everything else? Would that be different for something in a different genre? So my breakdown was first I cre created a prototype and then I made a list of all the different features that I want to create and I made a Trello board and I basically laid out everything that I want, wanted to do to a list of, let's say, I don't know, 15, 20 elements. And I just, every day I kept working on it. So that was my basic planning. And for testing, I had some friends that were willing to help. So I just sent them the game and I watched them play it and I got some feedback. Development took around four months of full-time development, I would say. And it would definitely be different for every game, even in the same genre. Because it has so many factors, like how big of a game do you want to make? Is it going, is it going to be a 3D game? Is it going to be a story-based game? Is it going to be a survival game? All those things make a great difference. So Bluebin said, can we just use one scene and change the player an icon to a node in main game scene? Okay, this is a great question. Yes, you can just use one scene here. So for example, inside of here, I could have just used this game scene and created everything here. But the good thing about scenes is, with, just like with the coins, I can basically create infinite amounts of players here. And you can also do that with normal nodes. You can basically duplicate them over and over again. But if you want to make a change to a single player, then you need to change all of the players. Whereas if you have a scene here, if I change the sprite here to be of scale point one, let's say, that's going to affect all the scenes here. Whereas if you only had one scene and you had nodes here, you would have to change all of them. I hope that answers the question. So Rob said, you said you outsource some art assets. Any advice on where, where to go for that? How much does it usually cost? So yeah, I would say what I did was I went on Reddit and there are a couple of subreddits that you can go to to get people willing to do work for you. So I would just go there uh, and I would create a post. I would say I'm looking for, for an artist for my game and some and people would send their applications to me and I'd go through them and it usually costs it depends on how much work do you want to get done what like some artists are very expensive some don't really have a portfolio so they're willing to work for cheap so I can't really say much on that part so one more question we have do can we export the scene to other game software like unity you really can't uh, yeah it's just the way it is you can't, sorry. <laughs> so wait, before I keep answering, let me also send you guys. My course on Udemy as well, which if you're interested, of course. So Rob said, what was the biggest problem you encountered while creating a game, which took you completely by su surprise? My biggest problem was probably, hmm. I really haven't had that big of a problem yet because that's probably because I didn't really make a very, very complex game yet that takes years to create. Most of my projects were under six months and they were comfortably inside my skill set so so i was very confident that i could make a game of that caliber and i basically just had to show up every day and make it happen
Yeah, no problem. So if anyone else has questions, if not, I think we can wrap this up. And now that the talk is over, feel free to open your mic and ask me like via uh, voice as well. So I think Sasha is recording this and I don't know if she's going to host the file some, some, in some place. So if she can. Yes, I will uh, share the recording of this event in the meetup. I, I can't hear you, Sasha. Can you ask? Can you hear me right now? Yep. So I will share the recording of this event in the meetup group. So definitely. Please track it. Once it's done, it's uploaded to YouTube and will be shared. Great. Cool. So if we have no more questions, we will probably wrap up the event. While I'm giving thanks to everyone, you still have your last seconds writing something. Okay, guys, thank you so much, Khan. First of all, thank you so much for delivering such an informative and beginner-friendly workshop. We appreciate it very much. And thanks a lot of uh, the audience who joined us, who stayed with us until the last. It was very cool to have you all, guys. And um, I hope to see you in our workshops next. Please uh, keep in touch with us. Please follow our meetup channels and uh, social media channels. And for Khan, good luck with your uh, journey. Please, uh, we are waiting for new games from you. Create, build, and you know, share, make money, make some companies. You know, <laughs> see you next time. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Sasha. Thanks, guys, for showing up. It was awesome.